and welcome to the episode 187 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today's show revolves around the fateful meeting, a cruise, and a world premiere. Let's start the episode with the 6th of July 1957 meeting that changed the course of history. On this day, the quarrymen, John Lennon's skiffle band, had an afternoon performance at the summer fete of the St. Peter's Parish Church. The booking was secured thanks to the mother of Pete Shotton, washboard player of the band, which, at the time, also comprised of John Lennon on guitar and vocals, Rod Davis on banjo, Len Gary on pea chest bass, Eric Griffiths on guitar, and Colin Hunton on drums. The fete was the highlight of the year for the neighborhood, and it featured food stalls, craft vendors, games, police dog demonstrations, and the crowning of a rose queen chosen from the Sunday school groups, as well as music. It was all held in the open, in a field behind the church, where a succession of lorries served as stages for the performers. After the show, while the boys were setting up for the evening performance for the dance in the church hall, Ivan Vaughan, former member of the band, introduced his friend Paul McCartney to the others. Paul was Ivan's classmate from Liverpool Institute and had the distinction of being able to play guitar. McCartney had watched the afternoon performance and started to chat with Lennon a bit. Paul offered to teach John how to tune a guitar properly, as his instrument, as well as Griffiths', were tuned like a banjo. Having done that, McCartney launched into a performance of Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock and Gene Vincent's Bebopalula, two of John Lennon's favorite songs. John was impressed by Paul's ability to recall all the lyrics. He always forgot them and often resorted to coming up with his own version on stage. Paul also played a whole lot of shaking by Jerry Lee Lewis on the piano of the church hall, impressing all the more John with the apparent ease of his performances, a stark contrast with the heavy work that the quarrymen had to do to put together their stage chops. The quarrymen, Vaughan and McCartney, went to a local pub in Woolton where they lied about their age to get served. After the evening performance, John discussed McCartney with his close friend and bandmate Pete Shotton, as he couldn't make up his mind. On one hand, asking Paul to join the quarrymen meant securing a talented musician that would raise the quality of the band's performances. On the other, Paul was so talented that he could challenge John's leadership within the band. It was a tough choice for John Lennon. During the night, it was decided that they had to ask Paul to join. On this date in 1961, the first issue of Mercy Beat appeared on newsstands in Liverpool. Mercy Beat was a weekly newspaper launched by Billy Harry, a former art college friend of John Lennon and Stu Sutcliffe. For the occasion, John penned an article titled Being a short diversion on the dubious origins of the Beatles, his first printed prose. Harry was a good and prolific writer, with an interest in jazz, who had dreamed to start a jazz magazine for some time. After falling in love with the Beatles, he had tried to interest the national press with the local scene, without any success. He then decided to start Mercy Beat, a rock and roll magazine, to feature articles on the local rock and jive scene, along with album reviews. In a sense, it was all very amateurish. Jim Anderson, a friend of a friend, gave Harry the money to start the magazine, and his girlfriend Virginia helped him with much of the work. Another friend, Dick Matthews, acted as photographer. Regardless, the first issue sold so well that even Billy Harry himself was surprised. Moving on to 1962, we find the Beatles with Pete Best on drums, 
engaged for their second Riverboat Shuffle event. We'll cover the first and the basic idea of the event in episode 237 of What A Fab Day, but for now, it suffices to know that these were variety shows lasting for the duration of a cruise on the Mercy River. These events were organized by Ray McFall, owner of the Cavern Club. For the occasion, the Beatles shared the stage with jazz clarinetist Acker Bilk. Bilk's single, Stranger on the Shore, was still in the top 10 after more than six months. A veritable success. Before the show, Bilk, who routinely wore a black bowler hat during his performances, decided to give one to each of the Beatles as a present. Talking about presents, I can't help talking about support. Chances are that if you're listening to this podcast on a platform, they're profiting from your attention and they're not sharing their profit with me. If you like what you're hearing, then head to www.simonmas.com support and learn what you can do to help me to keep going. A share on your social media, a message of appreciation, or even a small donation through PayPal will make a lot of difference. On the other hand, if you think my work can be improved upon, do send me a piece of your mind. Constructive criticism can help a lot too. Thank you! On the 6th of July 1963, the Beatles, now with Ringo Starr on drums, performed at the Victory Memorial Hall in Northwich. Before their performance, they attended the annual Northwich Carnival at Verdin Park, with Paul McCartney having the honor to crown the Carnival Queen. One year later, in 1964, the Beatles attended the premiere of A Hard Day's Night at the London Pavilion. 12,000 fans were outside, waiting to see them arrive, with the police forced to close off Piccadilly Circus. Despite being a small budget production, with £180,000 spent for the whole deal, about £3,672,000 in 2020 money, and the United Artists seeing the film just as a quick way to make a profit, A Hard Day's Night turned out to be very different from other music-related films made on both sides of the Atlantic. It displayed wits, a fresh presentation of its stars with a quasi-documentary approach to their lives and a nice mise-en-scene. Richard Lester, a virtually unknown film director with a knack for witty and surreal scenes, and Alan Owen, a Liverpoolian scriptwriter who had enjoyed numerous TV, radio, and stage successes, were certainly key to the spectacle that the people watched on the screen with excitement. The two were hired by the production after suggestions from the Beatles and their manager Brian Epstein. After the screening, there was a premiere party, attended by the band, Epstein, members of the production and cast, and friends of the band, including the Rolling Stones. Initially held at the Dorchester Hotel, the party later moved at the Adlib Club for whoever wanted to join the celebration. In 1966, the Beatles started their first proper visit of India. Technically, this was meant to be a relaxing stop after the first leg of their war tour, but they had little chance to chill and were literally surrounded by fans from the moment they landed. Finally, let's close the episode on a good note. In 1969, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were discharged from the Sutherland Hospital in Scotland where they had been since their 1st of July car crash. Well, this is it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to cover a birthday… and more. Tune in if you're interested in more stories about the four you love. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.